Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 687. Today, past guest Jason Brick is back to talk about what we've titled the incomplete violence conversation. What does that mean? Well, you're going to have to stick around to find out. Who am I? I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show. I founded Whistlekick. Why? Well, because I love martial arts. I love traditional martial arts and traditional martial artists, probably like you. And so that's why we do all these things that we do here at Whistlekick. What's Whistlekick? What do we do? Go to whistlekick.com. That's where you'll find all the things that we do, like our store. And if you use the code podcast15, that's going to get you 15% off something like maybe a hoodie, like this one that I'm wearing here, or maybe some sparring equipment, or maybe a training program. We got a bunch of stuff over there. So go check it out. It's also the place you're going to find all the other things that we're doing, because we are a lot more than a podcast in a store. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com is the place to go for everything related to the show. We bring you transcripts and photos and videos and links and all kinds of good stuff for each episode that we do. We bring you two a week. Why? Well, to connect, educate, and entertain. And if you find value in that, you've got a lot of things you can do to show some love back. We've got a Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick, where we give you even more stuff. You want to know who's coming up for a guest? Only place to find out. Do you want extra episodes, audio, video? We do that on there too. Depending on the tier, we've got all kinds of cool stuff from a mastermind to you get books for free, stickers. It's cool. Check it out. Patreon.com slash whistlekick. You want the whole list of all the things you can do to support us? Whistlekick.com slash family. It's free. It's not linked anywhere. And we do even throw in bonus stuff, kind of like a mini Patreon that you're not going to find anywhere else. You got to check it out. We update it every week. So Jason Brick, I, Jason and I talk a lot about a lot of things outside of the show. Since his first time coming on, I should have looked up what episode number was. I don't remember, but you know, Google's pretty easy to find. You can look it up. Uh, we've remained in contact. He's a great guy. We are aligned in just about everything when it comes to martial arts and our missions to support martial artists. And so he has a new project coming out and he reached out and he said, hey, can we talk about this? And I said, absolutely. And what we did, we didn't just talk about his project. We talk about everything related to it, why this project needs to exist and where does it come from? What am I talking about? Well, you'll find out soon enough. So stick around. My conversation with Jason Brick about violence and the incomplete aspects of most martial arts conversation on the subject. Hey, what's going on, everybody? If I did my job right, you got a, a brief intro before we got to here. Who knows? Maybe I didn't. Maybe this is the first the first part. I, I, I don't know. I gotta, there are a lot of things going on. This is not the type of episode we usually do, which is why I'm excited about it. Bringing back past guests. Oh, shoot, what episode were you on? Do you remember? I was in the, it was uh, 2020, kind of mid 2020. The number I couldn't tell you off the top. I couldn't tell you either. I should have done my <laughs> job and, and actually looked that up. Uh, brought back Jason Brick. We're going to have a conversation today about violence and why the conversation around violence is both incomplete and, in my, in my opinion, grossly skewed to the most, the, the least relevant parts. Is, is that is that a fair assertion? Absolutely. About what we were going to talk about, that, that's yeah. a good summary of what we're going to talk about, right? Yeah. Exactly. The, oh, the, the stuff we spend the most of our time and energy on in terms of self-defense and personal safety is the really sexy stuff that most of us will never actually use. Whereas most of us do use a number of other skills. A lot of, a lot of the professionals are calling them soft skills. Mm. on a regular basis. And sometimes we use them in a way that we don't notice that it worked. This is one of the reasons yeah. that, that when I, when I espouse the virtues of martial arts, mm -hmm. yeah, self-defense is in there, but what about all the rest of the stuff? Mm -hmm. You need to be more flexible, stronger, balanced, resilient in the face of a overwhelming, stressful world every day. You're probably not going to get jumped by six guys with dicks every day statistically that's never going to happen to you so why and if it is you need to really seriously re-examine oh, some of your life choices yeah 
Yeah. So that, that's, if that's the thrust of the conversation, where do you want to start? Well, I'd, let's start with uh, one of the, my go-tos when I talk about martial arts and their benefits is if you ask serious martial artists, what's the most important physical self-defense skill you have learned in the entire time of your training? You're going to say falling skills. I think because you haven't been in a fight in 20 years, but you fall down twice a year, whether you need to or not. Right. In terms of physical self-defense, that falling skill is going to save your life, prevent serious injury, maybe extend your lifespan more than every bit of the kicking, punching, stabbing, and shooting that you're ever going to learn. Because self-defense is more than just mm -hmm. what you do when you are attacked. It is defending yourself from the world. Yes, from injury. And if you want to go really far, you know, get really far out there, you could consider jogging a form of self-defense because I mean, we're middle-class, middle-aged people live in the suburbs. Chances of, of us actually being mugged or assaulted or an assassin coming after us are very low, but that heart attack, diabetes, certain forms of cancer, that cardio workout we get from our martial arts training is going to be way more effective as a form of self-defense sure. than any of the actual hands-on stuff, especially if we're being smart. I would totally agree. Mm -hmm. Why don't we talk about this stuff more? You, you, I think you said kind mm -hmm. of at the top, like it's, it's less sexy. Mm -hmm. why, why is talking about things that never happen sexy and talking about things that actually make people's lives better not sexy? You know, I don't, I'm not a good enough psychologist to have a real sm strong sense of that, although it's absolutely true. You know what? I've, I've thrown out the joke in my podcast a couple of times that nobody's dropping $16 to watch a movie of Jason Statham not get in a fight. It's true. Right? It's not very exciting. Yeah. And you can get into, there is some psychology about why humans are so obsessed with sex and violence mm. and sports. And one theory is that those are like the three times in modern life that are true that it's you doing your best with somebody else in the room and you're going to find out shortly whether or not that best is good enough but i don't know how much i buy it it's a, it's a little alpha male for me sure uh there's a little bit of chest something going on there but there may be something to that that you know the violence we're fascinating with violence because there's a test and a trial in violence that we don't see in the rest of our lives mm -hmm. um of course our cultures and not just western cultures but most cultures have you know I want the word that's in my mind right now is deified, and that's not right. Um, fetishized, even maybe. Um, violence as a way of having solutions. You just look at the popularity of um, action movies versus uh, you know, movies about uh, personal drama. And it's, we are fascinated with violence. Mm. And also, we are afraid of violence in a way that we're not afraid of a heart attack, in a way that we're not afraid of um, having a less than fulfilling relationship with our family. And because just, we normalize and, those things because they happen yeah. all the time. Yeah. And that's kind of the, this broader conversation about self-defense, protecting yourself. We, when we were talking before the show, I pointed out how many people listening to this program have read, say, The Art of War or The Book of Five Rings. And chances are almost all of us, yeah. right? How many of us have read The Five Love Languages? How many of us have read uh, The Four Agreements? How many of us have taken a class on uh, mediation and active listening? Or go, go one step further, when was the last time you took a specialized seminar on weapon disarms or some other esoteric form of hurting people? And then when was the last time you uh, took a medical class? Mm. It's true. It, it is mm. a, a massive, I don't know if I want to, mm -hmm. it's definitely a hole. It's a gap yeah. in the broader conversation, whether you mm -hmm. want to term it a martial arts conversation, a self-defense, mm -hmm. a violence conversation, mm -hmm. you know, for, for purposes here, we've talked about it as violence, it's what we threw in with mm -hmm. the title of the episode, but it's obviously a lot more than, than that, because if we, you gave some really good examples about rounding out knowledge via books or classes, and, you know, there may be some people saying, well, you know, yeah, I, I, I learned Kung Fu, but I've also learned some, some healing practices. Mm -hmm. You're not the norm. You are yeah. the exception, not the rule. And while there are plenty of us who find value in that, the conversation as an industry is not about that. The majority of martial arts schools don't teach avoidance, de-escalation. Um, 
they do not teach, okay, so once you've injured this person, here's how you make sure they don't bleed out mm. when you call 911. In fact, the majority of schools teach the exact opposite. Get out of there. <laughs> don't yeah. be there when the police arrive. And yeah, we could have a, probably a really long conversation just on that one aspect. And I'm not suggesting that there aren't cases for each side of that conversation, but the fact that the conversation is so lopsided warrants conversation itself. No, I absolutely agree. And one thing that's been kind of interesting, when you had me on before, it was to talk about my show, Safest Family on the Block, where I take my experience as a martial artist, a father, and a journalist, and I interview experts from every discipline I can find about keeping families safe. And a through line from some of the you know, some stone badasses again and again and again and again was the importance of avoiding violence when you can, mm -hmm. not just because bottom line, you know, you're an advanced martial artist, I'm an advanced martial artist. We step into a combat, even against some 17 year old idiot, we have a non-zero chance of dying or going to jail forever. Absolutely. If we avoid that fight, we have a 0% chance of dying from that fight. Um, and that's just how it is. And so it's not only good sense, but also, that if you are good at violence, you have a responsibility to avoid violence whenever possible. Yes. The only way, I, I've said this before, the only way you want to fight is to avoid it. Mm -hmm. It's the only way everyone wins, right? Do yeah. you want someone to lose a fight? I mean, obviously we all want to go home, but why not mm -hmm. want that for the other person? Mm -hmm. Why not yeah. create an opportunity? Why let a, mm -hmm. an acute situation create a potential, potentially chronic mm. condition whether yeah. that's long-term injury death mm. prison lawsuit etc mm. and i think that's a that's a part of martial arts culture that is there and you and i have certainly both enjoyed it but there's a fantasy of violence that we see in the movies we see in tv if you play video games role-playing games there's humorous violence you know the qu quickest way to a man's heart is through his back you know, and we laugh at that, right? You know, martial arts, putting the fist into pacifists since, <laughs> since time immemorial. We make all those jokes and we, you know, we've all learned a technique that just ruins the subject and walked away from that kind of giggling like Beavis. <laughs> that was cool, right? And we all do that. But there's a fantasy of violence within the martial arts community that does not map in any way to how it feels when you actually have to be violent. Violence is primal mm -hmm. and it is okay mm -hmm. that we acknowledge that. And it is also okay that we exert energy to be beyond that, mm -hmm. to yeah. go above that, right? Anybody who's had kids know that mm -hmm. children have a predisposition to solving problems physically. Mm -hmm. We might not call it violence, but when they're, you know, they hit, they kick, they bite, they push, and we teach them as they grow up, this is not the way to solve problems. Mm -hmm. And yet for a lot of martial arts schools, and I'm, I'm not gonna say many or most, but a lot, that's exactly what they do. Mm -hmm. Problem arises, it has to fit into a model of violence and mm -hmm. solving the problem with physical contact. Even if it's nonviolent, it's still violent because it still mm -hmm. involves two plus people engaging in a physical altercation. And you hope, yeah, you know, nobody comes out of that really hurt. But what about the rest of it? So let's let's go yeah. there. What about the rest? What about some of these other mm -hmm. words we've thrown out there? De-escalation and avoidance, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. And these are these are the important points. One thing, uh, you and I have both studied Kempo, spent a fair amount of time, and you know. You get up there in classes. Okay, I'm going to teach you what to do if a guy throws a right punch at your face. It's like, well, what about the hour before he threw a punch on my face? You know, what are the things we can do? Are there, can we use humor to de-escalate the situation? Can we leave the bar when things are getting, getting rowdy? Quite some time ago, I wrote an article about uh, staying safe when you're traveling abroad. Mm -hmm. And one of the points I made was, you know, you know what, how things feel and what's dangerous, what's not dangerous in your neighborhood. You don't know what that is in Bangkok. You don't know what that is in Caracas. But the other people in the bar or the restaurant or the market square do. So in that situation, 
if you just kind of pay attention and you get a feel for the crowd and if people start leaving or people start seeming nervous, it's time for you to get in the cab and go home. Right. We see this in movies all the time, but not with people yeah. with animals, right? Yeah. There's all there, there's that scene in a lot of disaster mm-hmm. movies where all of the animals run by and mm-hmm. some movies make it dramatic enough to include animals that would typically not be friendly. You know, when you see mm-hmm. the gazelles and the lions running side by side in the same direction, not from each other, but together, mm-hmm. something really nasty is going on the other direction. Yeah. And, but we, we, don't, we don't tend to talk about that mm-hmm. within our own species, the idea, okay, if nobody's going over there and you're a visitor to this mm-hmm. area, you should probably not go there. Yeah, exactly. And uh, in, the, in the book that I'm kickstarting in a couple of weeks, we'll talk about that in some detail later, I kind of divide these skills into four categories and it starts with avoidance. Sorry, not avoidance, that's up. Starts with preparation, then awareness, then avoidance, then de-escalation, and then finally escape. And these are five categories. And you can sometimes think of it as, you know, a lot of martial arts are teach these concentric rings of um, responsibility and threat, right? Where if they're this far out, you got to wash their legs. If they're this far in, you start washing their hands, their elbows, et cetera. And you can kind of view that in the same way, only often instead of in distance, it's instead of time. Sure. And for example, if you're traveling to Newtown, you can hop on uh, the local police reports. You can talk to a friend who lives in town. You can use Google Maps. You can use other reports and the tools mm-hmm. and know which, ta- which parts of town to avoid. Sure, sure. And that is as truly self-defense and far more self de- effective self-defense than going into that bad part of town as a 4-3 black belt or strapping a gun on her hip because this bar might require a gun. Can you run through, mm-hmm. let's, let's take yeah. a common scenario and, and you gave the mm-hmm. example of, of a vacation and I really like this yeah. one because I'm, I'm currently looking at taking some time off and I'm evaluating mm-hmm. where I go. And one of the things that I'm doing in the preparation stage is mm-hmm. identifying certain countries that I could legally logistically travel to that I am not going to travel to. That's a pretty mm-hmm. obvious one. But why not take that, mm-hmm. let's, let's take that example of a family vacation and, mm-hmm. you know, let's, let's hit those stages with, uh, you know, an analogy, mm-hmm. a story, an anecdote that illustrates them for the people watching or listening. Absolutely. So let's, let's say we're I'm traveling taking a family vacation somewhere, we've decided we're not going to go to any of the, the key places. You know, we're not going to do Disneyland this year. We're not going to do the Grand Canyon. We're just going to go to a city and hang out in that city and learn and feel, get, get a sense for that city for a couple of weeks. And then the first choice, of, we're in that preparation stage. And it starts with choosing a safe city. Yeah. And then you, you use some tools. The, uh, the U.S. Department of Defense has a really good country uh, security briefing that's free that you can get online. I like Australia's a little better just because the U.S. one's a little more, it's a little more political. Okay. Um, but Australia's is a, is, is either more neutral or because I'm not Australian, I don't see the glaring political bias. It's one of the two. Okay. Uh, there are apps. Uh, there's one right now called Safe Esteem, and they're coming out with a civilian version where this data nerd who used to be an international man of mystery runs the numbers and will tell you in terms of numbers, how safe a city is compared to your hometown for violent crime, for property crime, for health issues like air quality, mm-hmm. um, uh, proximity of hospitals and things like that. So you can oh. use these tools <laughs> to find cities and, and rate them. Uh, for example, I, I interviewed him for my show not too long ago. and He told me that St. Louis is more dangerous than Sao Paulo and more dangerous than Mexico City. <laughs> wow. Never, I did not know that. <laughs> never, we we have this this uh, mm-hmm. this bias towards yeah. where we are again being mm-hmm. normalized, yeah, and thus safe. Yeah, and he did make it clear that that's in terms of um, violent crime statistics yeah. for a white English speaking person. Then it also who knows the rules of St. Louis better than they know the rules of Sao Paulo or whatever maybe that gets skewed. But the point is that you can find this data, you can find this information and then make a decision about where you go. And so we're gonna avoid St. Louis, right? And taking a look at things, we're gonna go ahead and choose a Kuala Lumpur mm-hmm. because it's a relatively safe town. There's, it had some civil unrest a couple of years ago, but it's settled down and you know, they don't 
the weapons laws in Malaysia are pretty serious. And so you're not likely to accidentally get stabbed. I mean, you can always get stabbed on purpose no matter where you are, but you're unlikely to accidentally get stabbed, right? And you look into those stats, you find out the property crime is fairly serious, but the, you know, the violent crime is very low, especially to tourists because you know the cops know where the money comes from. And so they're gonna crack down on people who are, violent, who are victimizing tourists. And so you do that, you do that research. And then now that you know you're going to Kuala Lumpur, you go take a look at specialized reports on Kuala Lumpur. You go to the Lonely Planet website. Mm. You call a buddy of yours who was there for business a couple of years ago. You watch a couple of documentaries. You find out, you know, find out what hotel you're going to be on. And you talk to the concierge and find out, you know, what does he know? And you do all these things. And this is all preparation that is legitimate self-defense. Because if you end up in a hotel in a rough part of town, all of a sudden your danger goes way up. If you decide you absolutely want to go check out this one tourist attraction, all the, but it's in a neighborhood that's been suffering civil unrest extensively for the last six months, that's also a bad idea. So this whole preparation stage, which a lot of people don't think about, uh, which I have have not yet been in a martial arts school that taught this, is a form of self-defense that absolutely avoids even the possibility of certain kinds of violence in certain situations exploding. The only way you can avoid the violence in an area is to mm-hmm. not be there. Like, truly, yeah. you talked about non-zero mm-hmm. and zero. That's the only zero. The only zero mm-hmm. way I avoid the violence in St. Louis is I don't go to St. Louis. Yeah, which is too bad because I like St. Louis. But... Never been. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I go to a nerd convention there. Uh, there's a tabletop role playing game convention there every year. And I go there. I mean, COVID means that it hasn't gone for a couple of years, but yeah. Yeah. I wish I'd known that about St. Louis before I just went and stayed in a random hotel, uh, but you know, nothing happened. I lucked out. Uh, so yeah, but that preparation you would prepare more. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Now that I'm armed with that knowledge, right. no pun intended, I'd prepare more. And then that preparation goes net, you know, the next stage of that preparation is, you know, you're going, when you're going to go there and you decide where you are going, what other preparation can you do? And that includes, you know, your EDC or your modified EDC because you're in a foreign country. So the laws are different. And, and even little things like you did your research, you find out that Kuala Lumpur is low on violent crime, high on property crime. So nobody's carrying a purse. Hmm. You're not wearing a fanny pack. You've got your dummy wallet and you've got your money in your sock. You got to, you know, you decide not to use your $700 iPhone, but buy a $150 mobile phone there in country. So, and just those little things that prevent, because even property crime, although it's property crime and it's not dangerous, can escalate to danger if something goes wrong. Yeah. So anyway, those are some examples of how we can use preparation to avoid violence and avoid ever, well, avoid ever getting to use that really cool technique we learned last week. What was the next phase? You talked about preparation. And then we go to awareness. And I feel like Mm -hmm. awareness is where a lot of martial arts schools do spend a little more time. That situational awareness has that tactical feel. Start talking about the Cooper color codes. Start talking about the OODA loop and all of those things. That tactically aware mindset, which I'm not a huge fan of because it's exhausting. It is exhausting. Uh, Yeah. Rory Miller has a really good riff on this about you know condition yellow stay in condition yellow stay in condition yellow and and you're tired by the end of the day but if instead you're just mindfully aware and curious you not only spot the bad guy but you also see the rainbow Mm. and the puppy and it's a much nicer headspace to be in but it also means that you see the danger coming it's a skill set it can be trained yeah exactly the idea that you 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 Mm. look for the puppy in the rainbow but mm-hmm. the, the potential situation coming over here, right? And that comes from, like anything else that is exhausting, mm-hmm. training it, ingraining mm-hmm. it, and, and letting it be part of who you are. And there are ways to train that. You know, it's a little bit outside the scope of what we're doing here today. Mm-hmm. But you're right. I think a lot of martial arts schools will talk about this, even if it's as simple as sit so you can see the door. Yeah. And there's a there's a number of games you can play because you know a lot of a lot of my interests right now with the show and with my own experiences how to raise safer kids and so there's games you can play with young kids or with your friends with your martial arts buddies when you go for a beer after work is a really great time little things like uh, 
uh, it was Nick Hughes who plays a game with his friends where you come up behind your buddy, you cover their eyes, say, point to the exit. And if he can't, he buys the next round. Because <laughs> you, no, you should know where the exit is. Sure. But also a right? note of caution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you may want to uh, disclose with your friends that you were playing that game. Yes. Yes. Uh, and that game <laughs> should not involve, especially if it is a longtime trained martial artist, uh, that's probably a good mm -hmm. alcohol-free game. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Nick Hughes definitely comes from that uh, 80s and 90s military um tradition where a lot of a lot of things happened a lot of things went wrong but it's an interesting game uh one you can play with your kids is about sit down okay if if i wasn't here who in this room would you go to for help mm. you know identifying who would be helpful you can play with um on your own I almost said play with yourself but that's a different thing um but you can play on your own and uh, you sit down in a room and just okay who in this room is the most likely to be a problem mm. right and that's uh that's recommended by gavin de becker in his book um under two seconds where he trains his staff is to wherever they are identify the the most likely problem in the room and overwhelmingly not actually going to be a problem but that gives you the leg up if that guy turns out to be a problem and gets you in the habit of just kind of looking at everybody checking new people as they come in you know and take the opportunity mm -hmm. uh maybe you close your eyes and describe them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you identified the most likely threat, but what if mm -hmm. you leave this, the space first? What if they mm -hmm. leave first and create a situation outside? Could you actually yeah. describe them? Um, mm -hmm. What if there is chaos later and you don't know what's causing it? Can you describe that person? How mm -hmm. many people have said, you know, I saw this car, it was suspicious, and they can't even tell you the make, model, license mm -hmm. plate, and they're barely sure on the color. Yeah. And uh, that's another game that I've played with my boys and some of my friend, adult friends, uh, the nickname game, mm. where you just got, okay, so that's Beardy, that's Glasses, that's High Heels, that's ACDC because they're T-shirt, right? And then you can even close your eyes and try to recite them. And it gives you that one keying detail that makes you more aware, a little more able to advise them and this all just gets into that idea of awareness that you're paying attention and then as you're watching those you'll notice that you know beardy keeps touching his jacket pocket mm. as if he's reassuring himself that something's there all right or you see that uh, acdc is talking to high heels in a way that's making her uncomfortable or somebody yeah. leans into somebody mm. else whispering but they're yeah. staring down someone else right there's eye yeah. contact right mm -hmm. that that's a that's a common bar one that I watch. If I see that one, I'm probably mm. out. Yeah, exactly. Or, and then if you're walking around, you're, you know, I swear I saw that guy in the parka and that guy in the hoodie at the last place we stopped to eat. Mm. You know, and then are those, are those just other tours who happen to be doing the same walking tour that I bought a map for at, you know, at the hotel or are they, um, are they locals looking, looking for trouble? Oh, yeah. You know, and, and then once you have that awareness in place, then you can choose to, you know, avoid injury through rapid flight. You can choose to, especially in, in developed nations, it can often work just to make eye contact and let them know, hey, I see you. And then they'll go bother someone else. Often in developing nations, that is more likely to bring everything to a head. It's, it's a cultural thing yeah. um, and a police presence thing. But you have those plans and ideas for what you can do if you see trouble. And often, especially, you know, from my point of view as a parent who either I'm responsible for small lives or I'm responsible to get home to those small lives, you know, I'm out. But that awareness again, and again, that's self-defense in a surer way. And to my mind, a more responsible way than all the kicking and the punching and the stabbing and the shooting. There is, there is no you. situation I can think of where being mm -hmm. aware of what's going on Mm -hmm. is a liability now you yeah. can take too much time you could prioritize mm -hmm. awareness over i don't know something more tangible hold on let me mm -hmm. let me uh what, what size shoes are you wearing right like that's mm -hmm. obviously a poor use of time mm -hmm. and energy but knowing what's up yeah nobody's mm -hmm. gonna argue that uh so preparation awareness what's next
And then there's avoidance. Okay. And that's um. There's a problem. There's a situation happening, and you're leaving before the situation develops. And that's that's the out of here. That's the those two guys are whispering and looking at those two guys who are whispering in the bar, and we are standing up and leaving. That's the hey, we're we're visiting the Alamo with our kids, and there's uh, protesters coming this way, and there's cops coming this. We're gone. <laughs> that's all of those basically leaving in one way or another and making the choice to leave. And this is one of the places that I feel like our culture and martial arts can often fail us because especially early in your training, there's that, I don't have to leave. I've had training. There's that sense that maybe it's a little cowardly to leave. Yeah. There's, it's an ego response. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, Mm -hmm. in my opinion, it's conflating avoiding violence with being fearful. I'm not afraid. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be afraid Mm -hmm. to not want to be in the situation. There are plenty of things I'm not afraid of that I don't want to do. Mm -hmm. I'm not afraid of going to the grocery store I don't like, but I'm not going to go there. I'm not afraid of butternut squash soup, but I'm not going to eat it (laughs) if I can avoid it, right? It's that simple. Right. There's a, you know? there's a whole, there's a, I, I would, I would even say that they're not even on the same spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. Fear, bravery is one action, non-action or, or action avoidance, however you want to turn that second spectrum. Those are mm-hmm. very separate things, even though that they can yeah. overlap or seem similar at times. Yeah. And, and I've, there's kind of two stages in the life cycle of a martial artist about this. And the later mm-hmm. stage is the you no longer walk away from a fight feeling weak, feeling cowardly. You walk away from the fight feeling merciful because it's like, dude, you have no idea. I'm just going to go. And before that, though, there is that you feel the way you're feeling a little weak, but then ask yourself, really, are you walking into that fight because you're afraid? How much courage is there in hurting another person because you're afraid of the bruise your ego is going to take if you walk away from the fight? What do you have to prove? Why? And if you have something to prove, why? Why do you have to prove something? Yeah. It's something that I see. Mm-hmm. It's very easy to see based on the content that martial artists post on social mm-hmm. media. I've noticed a lot yeah. of it on TikTok. Like you can really tell whose mm-hmm. ego is intact and whose isn't yeah. based on how they respond to critical con- uh, comments. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or how many critical comments they bring out. Like, I, for a while there, I kept getting into stupid fights with internet strangers on the martial arts community on Facebook. Yeah. And the number of times I'm like, I would say words almost exactly this, that, okay, every minute you're spending running down somebody else's art is a minute you should be spending getting better at your art. We made a shirt that said, shut up and train. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Shut up and train. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's, there's absolutely nothing. And, and this is a whole tangent that I'm sure you and I could go down. The audience knows we've gone down this, this tangent quite a few times in different ways. But the idea that how someone else trains has zero impact on you. It's not worth your time. If somebody is spending their time worried about how someone else trains, mm-hmm. probably means they don't actually train. Yeah, exactly. Or they're worried that their training is insufficient. Mm. And There's they no want to reassure there. themselves by telling themselves other training is even worse you know it's it's that same kind of it's the same psychology i think that you get behind any other kind of jingoism racism religious prejudice where you feel bad about yourself but at least i'm better than that guy man i i i I got knocked out in the first round of the jujitsu competition the other week but at least i'm not at a taekwondo competition because those guys suck it's like that was sarcasm for those of you Mm -hmm. who don't know jason Yes, exactly. Except for you. You, I know you're listening, and I mean you personally. Um, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> he probably doesn't listen to this show. <laughs> Again, kidding. <laughs> but, but yeah, that's, that ego is the thing that we have to conquer in that, in that avoidance stage, the giving ourselves permission to leave. Yeah. And if you get into a lot of the reality-based self-defense places, there's this... And I think it's an important thread of giving yourself permission to protect yourself, where especially if they're, if they're classes for people who are not 
long-term dedicated martial artists, don't have a military or police background, where you give yourself permission to hurt somebody who's trying to hurt you. Mm. And that's a barrier that if you don't spend a lot of time thinking about that in your daily life and your training, that is something to overcome. True. But the other side of that is people, you know, we who are studying violence, who are get training in violence, we need to give ourselves permission to not use that, give ourselves permission to leave the situation. You know, it's not our responsibility to hurt the bad guys and punish the bad guys. It's our responsibility to be around to protect and care for our families. Totally. It's interesting as we're going on mm -hmm. along this, this continuum here, what I'm noticing is the amount of effort that needs to mm -hmm. go in to get the same result of remaining safe is going up. The yeah. more I prepare, that doesn't take a lot of work, but the avoidance that mm -hmm. requires far more effort than preparation. And I suspect that it's going to keep going in that direction. So what I suspect is, so. What's that was three. So what's four? Uh, that's going to be your de-escalation. That's when you it's you've been engaged. And For now marriage? you gotta no. Um, maybe. And sometimes that's what causes the escalation, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? It's a shotgun wedding. Um, but yeah, someone's there with you and they want violence and you don't want violence. Mm -hmm. I, I have a story that I sometimes tell about uh, a situation where somebody who was drunk and aggressive was coming towards me for reasons that he thought were justified. And the backstory of that is I was in a particularly bad mood that day because of some stupid stuff that nobody really cares about. And as he was walking towards me, I put one hand up and said, think carefully. And apparently my body, my body language, because I, there was a small part of me that kind of could have used that. Um, and I'm really glad it didn't go that way. But he saw that and he turned around and went back inside the bar. And I got in my car and I went home. Hmm. But that is one kind of de-escalation. It's more violent, it's more aggressive. But sometimes you need to de-escalate by making it clear with your stance, with your language, with eye contact that not today, not here, dude. Sometimes um, an animal rolls over and plays dead. Sometimes mm -hmm. they puff up to look bigger. Yeah. Uh, humor often works pretty well. Okay. Uh, although if you guess wrong on that, it makes it much, much worse. Self-deprecating right. humor is usually the yes. same. Yes, exactly. There's a, there's a fellow, I forget his name, but his uh, an excerpt from one of his presentations has been doing the rounds on YouTube and Instagram lately about when the guy says, hey, what are you looking at? And he say, John, John James from uh, you know, Southside High School, class of 97. Hmm. He's like, no, I'm not John. So shit, man. I thought I thought I went to school with you, man. I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can I buy you a beer? Yeah. Right. And all of a sudden, it's all taken care of. Uh, there's a story that'll be in the book by uh, one of your guests, Alan Burris, and I won't yeah. I won't give all the details, but he's in a bar, and there's this big mountain of a guy with a bunch of military tasks kind of getting, and uh, things are starting to escalate. And the guy said to Alan, "Man, you're gonna need more friends." And he walks up and puts his hand up. Aren't you my friend, man? I, thank you for your service. I, and he, and he I correctly identified a tattoo that was uh, associated with that guy's uh, unit. I said, you were, I, I have respect for everybody. Like, Aren't we friends? And then the guy just smiled and they you know, had a couple of beers and ended it. Yeah. And it's, it's so easy to do that if you are motivated to do that. Actually, easy is not right, but it's, it is, it is, it is possible. Simple. It's definitely yeah. simple if you understand mm. the concept, and if you practice it, mm. right? Yeah. One of the things that blows my mind mm. about martial arts training is that mm. there is no school out there that I'm aware of that doesn't recognize mm. that utilizing your skills when you need them is different than when you are training them. Yeah. We all get that. Most schools seem to spend at least some time addressing that by creating mm. artificially intense scenarios so that you can work through things and know mm. that, okay, maybe I'm not perfectly adapted to this adrenaline response if things get murky, but I've spent some time there. I understand there's a difference. Mm. Hopefully I'll be, I'll fare better. But this is something that is relatively simple and 100% safe to do within the context of martial arts. And I do see it happen in some youth classes but it's that mm. it's practicing that de-escalation, that verbal mm. skill set 
of using humor, et cetera. And what's, what's nice is you've given a couple examples mm -hmm. that just about anybody could practice the whole, what are you looking at? That's pretty common. Yeah. Having a canned male and female name mm -hmm. that you can just draw from. What are you looking at? Aren't, aren't you John James? No, who's, oh, I'm really sorry. I was, I, I thought you were, and I was, I was looking, I was trying to see, like, you look like, him. I haven't seen him in a long time. I meant no harm. My apologies mm. if you were offended. Boom, easy, yeah. done. Yeah. Okay. If it's not John, if it's Susan, right? Like you can, you can have a handful of these just as you have a handful of techniques. And mm -hmm. I'm sure you've got other stuff. Probably there's, I mean, you gave the example of, of Alan Maurice with, with the, the tattoos. Great episode, by the way, if you all want to go back. We practice this stuff, or at least yeah. we can. And yeah. I think it's fun. The, I, you know, how many of us like picking on our friends, making jokes at other people's expense? Mm. Here's, a, here's, a, here's a license to do that. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, Mark McYoung makes the point that very often violence comes preceded by explicit instructions on how to avoid the violence. <laughs> you better da da da, or I'm going to whip your ass. Mm. So da da da, <laughs> leave the bar, apologize, go. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Often people give you an opportunity to deescalate. Um, interesting side note on that. Uh, I can't remember where I read or heard this, but uh, it was in one of my interviews with one of the experts, you know, these are, you know, long-term decades in violence, martial arts, whatever, recommended that the best place to get this training is go take an improv class. Completely agree. Putting words together while you mm -hmm. are stressed, mm -hmm. not, not easy to do. You want yeah. the best example of that? Go listen to some of my early episodes. <laughs> uh, and don't worry, we yeah. edited that part out. But now you can tell when we do video episodes, mm -hmm. it's, it's continual. I, I can yeah. find something to say, may not be perfect, but at least I'm saying mm -hmm. something. Right, yeah, so those, that kind of practice, yeah. And yeah, go, go be a guest on a bunch of podcasts. That works too. You know, any, cause you know, we talk about pressure testing our physical techniques, whether that's, you know, doing it, you know, you're, you put on the gloves, you're hitting a little harder, whether you, uh, Using, uh, using the timing where you do your technique and then the next guy in line is right on top of you. You know, all these different ways, you know, get in the red man suit, what have you, to pressure test those techniques. There are ways to pressure test our de-escalation techniques as well. And we should be doing that. Totally agree. All right. So there's de-escalate mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. escape. And finally, escape. Avoiding injury through rapid flight. Ooh. Run like, you know, run like hell. I'm also including in that ways to create a small distraction so you can go one that i uh, picked up from uh, jason hansen who is one of the guests on my show he's a former cia agent has a he has a brand around that is he keeps smoke a five dollar bill in his pocket yeah it, it's very close to smoke bombs keeps a five dollar bill in his pocket drops it on the floor hey is that yours it's it's money everybody's it's enough, eyes follow it's enough it. money that people will pick it up you know, they're not yep. going to do it with a quarter, maybe not a dollar, but it's yeah. not so much that if you do it, you're going to feel resistant. Exactly. Anybody's going to spend will five drop. bucks to not get in a fight. Exactly. Yeah. Any, any day of the week. And yeah, those eyes drop, your feet go. Yep. That's one example. Uh, in some ways that kind of circles back to the preparation because you know which way to run if you escape. Um, having a plan for if you are escaping when you have a four-year-old. You know, all of these things are in mind, right? And so that's the, that's the last one, but all five of these, you know, um, for escape, go take a parkour class for a semester, yeah. right? Because that's, you know, that's point A to point B as fast and as directly as possible. Yeah. You know, I'm actually, I'm actually uh, been wondering why police don't take parkour. <laughs> I think that most police would get more benefit from a parkour class than from a judo class. Uh, sadly, uh, mm -hmm. as it has been explained to me by several people, mm -hmm. and this is not meant to be a, uh, an authoritative statement, but the time mm -hmm. and the money allotted to yeah. any given law enforcement department for mm -hmm. ongoing training. Uh, I, I work with a firearms instructor mm -hmm. and 
I think by our third lesson, one, mm -hmm. one a month, by our third lesson, he said, I had invested more time in my training than departments, at least in Vermont, require across 12 months. Yeah, wow. yeah, it's, it is unfortunate. And part of yep. it, this is 2022, the country has been spending a year having a really frank, very emotionally fraught conversation about law enforcement. Mm -hmm. But the amount of training they get, because they don't prioritize that training in their financial budgets, is you know and it's not that it is not the fault of the police on the ground and i'm not saying that these aren't for the overwhelming majority good people doing their best in a really bad situation right but if we want them to do the job that they deserve to do we need to give them the training they deserve to have right. parkour is an interesting example because it, it mm -hmm. is all of the things that you're talking about it is preparation mm -hmm. it is mm -hmm. awareness it is de-escalation there are a lot of ways i, I did parkour mm -hmm. for a few years there are a mm -hmm. lot of ways you can address a particular obstacle mm -hmm. you're not going to do the ones that are the most likely to result in your injury unless you've mm -hmm. had a ton of preparation and you've worked up to it right you tend to take oh, okay well here's this thing i'm gonna you know vault over in this way and my feet are gonna keep going mm -hmm. yeah that's a good point i hadn't thought of about that the way but the yeah the way you address the obstacle is very much like the de-escalation. You choose the easier path. You move around it. Yeah, the, the way it was presented to me was A to B with the most efficiency of motion or economy mm -hmm. of motion. Mm -hmm. And that makes good sense. But yeah, so, and that's kind of interesting that, you know, these five segments, you can take classes on all of these things. And, you know, if I were, <clears throat> if I were still running a school these days, there's a very good chance my black belts would be staring down the barrel of, half a year in each of these disciplines yep. to get to certainly to get to advanced rank you know where go out take that stop the bleed training um i don't know how many listeners know about this but it's a uh, most of these trainings are free and it's a you know 90 minute two hour class you take at the community center the way you took your uh first aid cpr and it's specifically um very basic trauma medicine mm -hmm. about how to stop major bleeding and they've been get they're beginning some data because it's a few years old now about how it is saving lives Nice. And it's, it's, I think something on, you know, we know how to break them. We should know how to heal them. And this is a really good example. And it's again, uh, the, the organization behind it is making the training free. Do you know the name of the organization? Um, Stop the bleed. Stop the bleed. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. And they, I think they have some funding from some other organization. It's not the American Red Cross, but it's something like that. But yeah, you can go to stop the .org and find the class. Nice. All right. Yeah. My suspicion at this point is we've really mm -hmm. opened people's minds up, you know, kind of a mm -hmm. hallmark of this show. Let's talk about something and get you thinking. Mm -hmm. So I, I suspect people are thinking they're probably relating these, these five stages to their own training, or if they are an instructor, they're probably realizing, oh, you know, we spend a lot of time on this one or these two, we need more time on this one or these two over here. And of course, as always, if people want to follow up, if you want to give me your own mm -hmm. feedback, if there's stuff that we want to tack on to this conversation today, reach out, Jeremy at whistlekick.com. Mm. But you mentioned a couple of times there's a book. Yes, sir. I've written books. <laughs> They're really hard. If I remember correctly, this is not your first book. So uh, mm. collectively, what is wrong with us that we keep writing books? And why did you want to write this one? <laughs> yeah, so wanting to write a book is a whole other thing. There was a great flow chart I saw about, should I write for a living? And it's, are you capable of being happy without writing for a living? Yes, don't write for a living. <laughs> no, I suppose you should write for a living. Um, <laughs> yes, it is, but, it is very Yeah, true. it is. And I, you know, I've, made, I've made my my living for the last 12 years writing one way or another. And it's, mm -hmm. there are parts of it that I really love. But also there's a lot of time you spend just staring at the keyboard until, you're, um, until your forehead bleeds. But in this case, I actually got help. Nice. And it came again from my show where I was interviewing these, you know, certified badasses, TM, uh, who, and again and again, they were talking about the importance of avoiding violence. Mm. You know, how if you, if you're going hands on, you have screwed up nine times out of 10. And that got this idea for this anthology that I'm putting together. And the title is, There I Was When Nothing Happened. And what I've got is I've got true stories and anecdotes from these advanced martial artists, police, soldiers, bodyguards, a few criminals 
about times they used one of these skills to avoid violence. And we've got some alumni from Whistlekick, Rory Miller, Alan Burris, uh, Dave Kovar, and of course, you, Jeremy, are going to be in it. Right. And some other names that you might recognize, Tom Callis is going to be in there, Stephen Barnes is going to be in there, um, Andy Murphy, the secure dad, is it's quite giving the a really... Got going on. Yeah, yeah, we got you 40 different people. Uh, <laughs> you might have to have a follow-up episode about your, your, uh, your judgment, but... You know. <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's what my wife tells me too. But we've got forty different people involved uh, from very different. Most of them are in some ways a violence professional, but others are people who just had a very good story. Uh, my my college roommate is coming back in. He's a Kyokushin black belt mm -hmm. who was in the Peace Corps, and a gangster tried to kidnap him at gunpoint, and he got out of that by pretending not to speak Spanish, even when the guy put the gun and said, "Will you understand better with a bullet in your head?" <laughs> and he's like, lo siento, no, no entiendo, <laughs> until the guy, and so all these stories from people who, you know, 90% of the contributors could, could have certainly had the skill set and the experience to walk into the violence and provide um, an instructive opportunity for the person on the other side, right. but instead chose to avoid that fight. And we've got a variety of, you know, we've got some that are about preparation, some of them about avoidance, a lot of them about de-escalation, because those are often the funniest stories. Yeah. And, uh, you know, some about escape, some about awareness. And these are, I'm really, really, really pleased and touched at the level of contributors that we have. You know, so these are top guys and top yeah. women in the industry who want to contribute because they also think that it's important. You know, our, our industry and the publications around the industry don't pay enough attention to this topic. I, I completely mm. agree. And it's one of the things that we talk about both mm. internally and publicly at Whistlekick is the idea mm. that if we struggle with our own internal conversations, mm -hmm. that we should consider how that looks to people who do not train. If we're yeah. constantly arguing with ourselves, if we're constantly mm -hmm. focused on only the most violent elements of what we mm -hmm. do, does that foster interest in the next generation of martial arts? And yeah. my contention is no, it does not. So I think having mm -hmm. a project like this that showcases the many benefits of martial arts, even restricted to a self-defense uh, lens mm -hmm. that are not violent, yeah, I think it's brilliant. I, I don't know, brilliant, but certainly necessary. You know, I've, I'm, I'm not a very smart person, but I listen to smart people and I remember what they told me. And after, you know, a dozen episodes where very smart people who are at the tip of the spear about violence and violence dynamics were saying, you know, the best thing to do is not get in the tussle in the first place. Um, I, I started to pay attention. And, and I think you're absolutely right that uh, I'm going to use a bunch of marketing buzzwords, but brand as brand representatives for martial arts. Mm -hmm. sometimes the way we behave and the conversations we get into and even the things we come home really excited about don't necessarily um, put us in the best light. Uh, I'm in my, I'm in my second marriage and my first wife had many fine qualities. Our, our, we didn't work too well as a couple, sure. but she was a, she got a, a black belt in Kempo in Japan as a woman. So she's very oh. serious martial artist. Yeah. Um, and it took me about a year of adjusting with my current wife, who is not a martial artist. Um, you know, artists in very in, in different ways to stop coming home talking about this brand new way to kill a guy I just learned because you'd be like gross why would you <laughs> and then and, you, you, I don't want to put my hand there yeah exactly it's like hey hey honey grab my wrist no no <laughs> right awesome. uh, but but I think that you know the, the general public probably responds that way when they see us carrying on and so for nothing, for, for no other reason, but if we start this conversation, maybe we'll bring more people into martial arts and the world would be better if all of us were Fingers crossed. training, right? That, that, that's a point that I hit all the time. Mm -hmm. The world would be better. Yeah. How do I get this book? How do we get this book? All righty. So we're going to put it up on Kickstarter, okay. uh, crowdfunding platform. And on, starting on February 15th, 2022, we are going to have the, the preview page up where you can click a button and get on a mailing list to get updates. 
I recommend you do that because we're going to have a really cool deal for the first 24 hours. Okay. This is something I've done with other Kickstarter books where for the first 24 hours, everybody who buys a book, I'm going to give a book to a library. Oh, I love that. That's great. And just so get in, you know, get in there, get on the list so that you can be be ready to know. And then on the 22nd, the Kickstarter is going to go live. It's going to run three weeks. And then after that, and for those who are not sure what Kickstarter is for books, it's basically you're pre-ordering the book. And then we use those to pay the pay the contributors, pay the uh, what's that? The the cover design guy and all of that, yeah. and then to and then to do the printing. It, and we'll print the books. It costs we'll send money to make a book. It does. It costs Crazy. a surprising amount of money to make a book. Crazy. Yeah, but yeah, you go to the. We'll have the link to the preview page there in the show notes, and yeah, absolutely come to it. Take a look. We'll have some. One of the nice things about Kickstarter is uh, once you get on the list, you start getting updates. I'm going to be sending some each day. We have uh, some excerpts from some video interviews that I use like Jeremy here, he's going to write something. A lot of the guys just wanted to get on Zoom and tell the story, sometimes over a couple of beers. And I'm transcribing those, but we'll have some excerpts from those interviews that go up. We'll have some other stories going in there, um, some haiku uh, and all. So that you, know, you can be a, yeah, right. There should be more of those. Like, there there, no shit, there I was. <laughs> Seven guys in the damn bar. <laughs> what did I do next? Um, anyway. But yeah, go there and you can find it. Find me on Facebook as well. Uh, the, I'm active, especially on the martial arts strong community. And we're talking about there. A lot of the authors are in that community. And yeah, you do that and you can be right there. Part of the conversation as the book's being created. Awesome. I think for, for mm. folks who are listening, watching, mm. I, I'm the last thing I, I ever do when, when a guest comes on and they're, they're pitching something. I mean, there's a pitch here and there's a reason that it wasn't just a commercial, right? There, there's a lot of value here. That's something that's really important to me. But if you want conversations like this to continue, if you want people who have these stories to continue to tell these stories, once in a while, some of us have to buy the book. Mm -hmm. It doesn't yeah. exist in a vacuum. Uh, I'm going to buy the book. You would probably have sent me a copy, but I'm still going to buy the book on Kickstarter because I believe in things like this. We as an industry don't support each other well enough because we're constantly sniping at each other. I don't just come on here and say, you know, we need to be, you know, more, more coalesced. We need to be more supportive. I actually put my money where my mouth is and I do support as many of these projects like this as possible. I'm just not usually public about it because there's a fine line and I try not to cross it. it feels appropriate right now. Well, thank you. And I think in terms of, you know, the sniping, whether BJJ is better than Taekwondo and all that, all that silliness that the the core of this is something that we can all get behind you know for all we talk for all we fantasize for all we giggle when we learn a really really entertainingly violent technique uh we do agree that we should not get in a fight when we can help mm -hmm. getting in a fight and that curriculum i think most schools should teach this more and more powerfully and if at the very least they you know had the book in their pro shop you know yeah. at the very least you know and to put on the marketing hat a little bit, also, if it's there in your pro shop or it's there on your desk, when you're talking to the mom or the dad whose kid wants to do martial arts, but they're a little worried about the violence, um, everybody who's run a school or run a program has had this conversation. Mm -hmm. This is something that, so this, we teach that, but this is what we also teach. This is what we stand for. Mm -hmm. We believe in things like yeah. this. Mm -hmm. If we do our job right, your son or daughter will never get mm -hmm. any fight. Yeah. And that's, and that's what we want. And, you know, that's the irony too of martial arts training, that the more you train, the less likely you are to need your training. That's because, right. you know, we mentioned very early on about how there's, there's a lot of self-defense stuff we do that we never know if it's going to work. And a lot of that is just the way you stand and the way you walk. And the bad guy who is in the corner deciding who, to, who they're going to try to victimize what was the study? There was a study, two guys um, in the 90s where they had felons in prison look at videos of people walking on the street. Mm, and yeah, and okay, said, okay, who would you who would you victimize? 
and they picked the same people. No matter if gender wasn't a factor, race wasn't a factor, size wasn't a factor, the inmates' crime wasn't a factor. They all picked the same people. And they also, the study also asked them to pick to identify the people they would not under any circumstances try. And again, they picked the same people. And one of the one of the great benefits of martial arts training is that after a while, you start to look and walk like that second group rather than the first. Yeah. I'm with you. Awesome, man. So Kickstarter, what do they have mm -hmm. to search for something? Like, is there a direct link? So we'll put a direct link there in the show notes, but you okay. can also just search Kickstarter for There I Was, and you should be able to find it. I doubt that there will be another book that starts with the words There I Was, and if there is, this will be the one about martial arts. <laughs> Love it. It's awesome. Very I really cool. appreciate you coming on. This is good stuff. Love what you're doing. Glad that we can connect in this way, and uh, yeah. Thanks for doing it. Thank you so much, brother, for having us on. I appreciate well, the support. I hope you found some value in that conversation. I did. I always talk. I enjoy talking about stuff like this. I like conversations where we go in these different directions and it leaves me thinking. When we finished this talk, my mind was spinning. And if you've been listening to the show for a long time, you know that it's from a lot of that spinning that future episodes, future topics, even elements that I bring in with guest conversations come from. So I want to thank Jason, not only for coming on and for putting together what he's putting together, but for giving me the opportunity to talk about and think about this stuff some more. For me, that's the value of the Thursday episodes. And I know for a lot of you, that's also one of the things that you enjoy. This is a good place for me to remind people, we are not pay to play. I am receiving absolutely nothing for either Jason coming on this show, my contributions to the book, nothing, because I want to maintain that line of integrity. Okay. It's the truth. I hope that you will support him. I, I truly am going to buy a copy, sign up for a copy, whatever the proper verb is with regard to Kickstarter to support the production of this work, because I want more of us supporting more of us in the traditional martial arts. Okay. I hope you will too. If you want to support us and the fact that we bring you these episodes and give you good stuff to think about and, and hopefully learn from, patreon.com slash whistlekick. We've got training programs at whistlekick.com. You could use the code podcast15 to save 15%. Uh, the flexibility program is completely free. 15% off zero is still zero. And if you want the whole list, whistlekick.com slash family. My email, if you've got guest suggestions or feedback or anything like that, Jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media, predictably at whistlekick. And that's it for now. So until next time, next episode, next whatever, train hard, smile, and have a great day.